morning. Well, my uh, name is Pepe Amenguao. I go by Pepe. My real name is Jose, but let's not get into details. Um, so I, I, I will talk a little bit about how I did I came here, kind of like my history. I'm a principal in Slano, it's a consulting company. Uh, I got involved with, um, you know, DevOps, you know, when dial-up networking was a thing. So you kind of know now how old I am. If you get close to me, you know, there's a lot of white hair. So, um, so I have been around for a while. I've been doing DevOps forever before the term was coined, you know, or SRE, because that's how I always worked, helping developers and so on. And I got involved with uh, Atlantis about three years ago uh, when I was kind of upset to, for, because I needed one feature, didn't know anything about Golang. And I decided to just learn Golang and, uh, and put my first PR and I made too much noise, so I ended up in getting invited as a maintainer. So that's how I ended up involved in the project. And then by indirect approach, I talked to Dylan and Dylan ended up being one of the maintainers. And, and now we actually maintain and we are, uh, we, we got the, basically the ownership of the, of the project after Luke and Mishra basically donated the project to us. So, so now we are the core maintainers of the Atlantis project. So that's a little bit about me. And this is Dylan. Hello everyone, I'm Dylan. Uh, I'm a senior DevOps engineer at Lambda. Uh, previously, I've worked at uh, DigitalOcean and Autodesk. Um, when Pepe asked me to join Atlantis, it was pretty much a no-brainer. Um, you know, Atlantis is very much a project when it comes to, you know, when you're working at scale, a lot of times you're, you and your team are doing Terraform or open tofu in this case now, runs locally from your laptop, trying to deploy infrastructure very quickly. And, you know, it, it becomes very difficult to, you know, coordinate. Okay, hey, I applied this. Wait, why does my apply say this? Oh, what, what's this doing here? So, you know, you, you really get uh, a lot of stuff for free when you have a central orchestration system that is able to kind of uh, keep track of everything and keep a history of who ran what, why, and when. Um, so, yeah. Cool. So, um, one question I have to ask, obviously, is that how many people here actually are using Atlantis this day? Yeah, okay. If you have complaints, I'm not going to be around, just so you know. <laughs> um, you, 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 could, you could potentially ask me for something, but um, we could review PRs, maybe. It depends how many beers we have uh, or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, um, uh, Atlantis has, has been around for a while. Is it 2005 or, or eight? 15. 2015? Yeah. Oh, okay. 2015. Funny enough, uh, I used to work half a block away from Luke and Mishra when they created a, a Atlantis for a Hootsuite. I don't know if you heard about Hootsuite. So I used to be, I, I maybe actually eat with him in the same restaurant. I didn't know he actually created the project that I, at some point I was going to end up being my maintainer. So it's pretty, pretty wild, right? Um, so for those of you that do not know what Atlantis does, is basically, I would say, maybe one of the first GitOps interactions with Terraform for you to run workflows uh, within your VCS. Right now, Atlantis supports basically four, actually there's, there's five VCSs. So we support ADO, uh, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, and uh, Dylan actually uh, merged uh, uh, GT uh, support yesterday. So now we support Gitty. Um, the, most of these contributions are community-based. A lot of them, uh, the project was based on GitHub. So there is a tons of support on GitHub, obviously. So it's a lot of the features we have are mostly GitHub related. That's how I got into the project. I, I needed GitHub groups for allow for different commands. So that's, that's uh, and, and we, were use, we use GitHub. So there is more support than others for different VCSs, obviously, and depending on how many users we have. But, but we have users that do, you know, for example, one PR a day, and some users that do actually 500 PR a day, which is crazy. And, and since then, we, the, the project hasn't changed much. Um, so um, right now, um, the, uh, I, I will get into those details a little bit later. But basically, what Atlantis does, and Atlantis is, uh, is um, is an orchestrator for, for you to run your Terraform workflows or any type of workflows. We are trying to be agnostic, so you're gonna, there's people running Atmos from Cloud Posse, which I used to work in Cloud Posse before. 
uh, they run CDK, TF, uh, or you, they run Terragram. So I tried to support Terragram for a long time. Uh, and OpenTOFU, obviously. So, and, and all that can be done through you know, um, uh, custom workflows that I will get into details later. Uh, Atlantis is a self-hosted app, so basically is a binary that you can that we uh, uh, distribute as, as containers. We have Helm charts, so you can actually uh, deploy it using the Helm charts in your Kubernetes cluster or uh, in a container ECS or any other cloud provider. It listens for the web hooks, basically, and then it interacts with you through the PR. So the idea is that you know the developer never leaves the VCS interface they have. It's kind of annoying when you have to click yet another thing to go to a UI that might not give you all the information, but if it's all in the PR, a lot of people uh, like to see it all in the PR and interact there, and, 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 and that's why it has so much track and people use it. And basically, you, what you do is that you interact through commands. So you, you, you create your PR, Atlantis might do auto-discovery, and then it will say, it will give you a plan, and then you will create a command, like here, you can do Atlantis apply, and it will basically run a Terraform apply and then you know, uh, deploy your infrastructure. So this is kind of how it looks like. And you guys can see that, that's big enough. Um, so basically, um, uh, in this case, for example, it's a very simple new resource uh, project, you know, uh, one, one liner basically of three lines. Um, and then Atlantis went and did the auto discovery and run the, the plan output. And this is how it looks like in your PR. So there is a comment from Atlantis bot, which you can call it whatever. Um, and, and then basically you can see the plan there, what's it going to do, and then we, we can apply a certain logic of rules or behaviors depending on you know, your, your business logic that you need to have for, for someone to be able to apply. Maybe there's few people that can apply it, or maybe there is rules that can be, that needs to be done, or you are going to run, I don't know, infra cost to get the cost before it's applied, whatever it is, um, you, can, you can customize it and then basically get an approval you run Atlantis apply, and then that's it. You're, you're basically, it uh, deletes the, if you want to, you can delete your, your source branch, and then basically main becomes the source of truth of your infrastructure. Um, we have certain components, so we have, by, by, by default, if you set up Atlantis, you, um, you have, you don't really have to Set up any of the of these files if you don't if you want to customize it, and if you run a simple PR, it will actually try to um, uh, auto discover the the Terraform files, and then it will try to run a plan, and then it will give you the output right away. And then from there, you basically start customizing. Most people obviously customize it, um, and so we have the repo YAML server side config, which basically it it it, it is the um, the file, and mostly the managers of Atlantis uh, deployment will configure for people then to use it for your developers to use it. So for here, you uh, you have uh, kind of like the um, the entry point for the repos to be uh, uh, to be parsed uh, through that regex where it says their ID, and then from there you will put all your rules. So we have we support post and pre workflows uh, that you can run. So you can actually auto create some of the files or, or, or inject files within your uh, workflow or your PR that maybe are not part of the PR because they come from dynamic environments or dynamic creation of files or Terraform files, whatever it is. Um, and you put all the, the rules that you want uh, for, uh, for the repos to follow within this file. So for example, you can create the workflows uh, that you want to uh, run, for example, Let's say that you need to run a, a specific uh, a script before you do Terraform init. You, well, you can set it up here, and, and then every, every, um, every repo will actually incorporate automatically, basically. And then we have the repo side config. So within that, that server side config I was showing you before, basically you can say, hey, um, these are the workflows available for you, and you cannot modify them. You just have to use this. And then over here, you basically can create your projects, set up which directories are, you know, for example, you can have a prod or, you know, dev or stage directory, and then you will you will maybe have different versions of Terraform and so on. These are some of them. The, the, the file was so long because we support so many customizable options, so I, I'm showing you just a little bit of that file. Um, but basically, when... Um, if you... Uh, if, if you can actually basically say to, to the user, 
well, you can use only this custom workflows, or you can be more open and say, well, you know what? You can actually customize the workflows in the repo side, so you have the two options. You can do it on the server side, so some of the options are actually trespassable between the two files, which makes a lot of, for, uh, opens up for flexibility. Uh, and I'm going to actually going to talk a little bit about that flexibility part. But basically, these are some of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the supported options that we have for people that want to use Atlantis a different way, so maybe a team will use it in a different way, and you will want to customize this file and give the, the, your, your teams uh, the option to do so. Um, the other thing that I can, Atlantis can do, basically you can run, like I said before, pre-workflows and post-workflows. For example, a post-workflow would be a very easy one. Actually, post-workflows were created by InfraCost. They actually created the PR, and, and we, uh, we merged in Atlantis, so thanks to them for, for that. And basically, post-workflows are e e everything that you will run after you know, the plan is done. So maybe you want to run, I don't know, TFSEC, or, or you want to run Combs test, or any other tool that you want to run against the plan, you can run it at that point. And pre-workflows are everything that happens before even the plan runs. Uh, before actually Atlantis tries to run a plan. So for example, you can create dynamically that Atlantis repo YAML because you actually do not know how many, uh, how many projects within the repo are. So you create the PR and, and if, the, if the Atlantis in the repo it is not, out, it is not uh, up to date, it might not actually figure out there is a new directory. So you can actually auto-generate it before actually it gets, uh, uh, the, the project gets discovered. So it gives you a lot of flexibility, and then you can inject other parameters that you might need to inject for the workflows and so on um, through using pre workflows. So um, uh, the other thing that we, we can, you can do, you can run, uh, we, we have a plugin for uh, conf tests, so you can run policy checks. So you can create real rules and, and run OPA rules against the, um, your Terraform if you want to and fail those. Um, you can, like I said before, you can generate or inject uh, files that may not be part of the commits for that repo, but they need to be generated in order for your workflows to run. So you can, that, you can do that in pre-workflows. Um, we have an API now, so, uh, well, now, a few years ago. <laughs> um, it's getting better, uh, but now you basically can run, there's people actually running this uh, using um, the API to run drift detection. So now you can create a PR that will run against all your uh, projects or your workflows. And then it will, if, if it finds a drift, it, then it creates a new PR because Atlantis is based on PRs. So you need to have a PR to actually you know, interact with your workflow. Um, and now we have actually more commands before we used to have plan and apply and help and now, well, and version. Now we have a state, a state RM import and unlock uh, right now. So yeah, so that's, that's kind of like what Atlantis can do. If you want to get started, those are some of the links. Just go to the website, that's runatlantis.io. We have a test drive that you can basically run locally against your you know, free GitHub or GitLab or whatever account. And you can run it locally and try Atlantis running your local. Um, and we have uh, the latest version, uh, 27.2, um, image and the Helm charts. And now it's uh, Dylan's time. So I'm going to go in a bit more uh, details about you know the history of the project, what uh, current roadmap, how we're uh, working to support Open Tofu, um, some of the stuff we uh, Pepe already uh, touched on. So I will kind of breeze through it. But one of the things I really want to call out is right now uh, Atlantis is uh, currently in the process of applying to the CNCF as a sandbox project. Um, originally, um, the project was created by Luke. Uh, when he worked at Hootsuite, uh, and then uh, he joined HashiCorp. Uh, so for a while, there was a lot of gray area uh, about what could we do with the project, what we were allowed to do. Um, and after some discussion, um, especially after the Open Tofu Manifesto, um, we were able to get Luke and HashiCorp to allow us to essentially donate the project to the CNCF. So that was a big, big deal for us, and we're hoping that this April, when the uh, committee meets uh, for sandbox applications, uh, we will uh, get approved. So please, um, there's a link in there for the application. Go thumbs up. Uh, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, so big goals for the project that we have. Um, there's been a big focus lately on trying to make the application stateless instead of stateful. 
Um, right now it's binary. A lot of the, uh, it runs by default internally internally with a bolt DB. Um, there's been, you know, features to try and kind of break that up. Uh, a lot of people either run Atlantis and Kubernetes or they run it separately in AWS Fargate. Um, but there's a lot of scaling considerations when you go, you know, using Atlantis with maybe one repo and you have a couple engineers, it's works great, but when you start getting to the scale of some of these companies where they have hundreds of repos with thousands of engineers, it quickly becomes difficult to vertically scale the application. So we're really working to kind of uh, break this apart into a stateless application. Um, there's been features for uh, supporting uh, external DB like Redis. Um, and basically we wanna try and move the project towards uh, more of an API driven platform. Um, where right now, originally the project was very much, you have to interact with the uh, user interface of your v, uh, version control provider. Um, and with the addition of API endpoints to be able to run plan and applies against a repo uh, with a pull request, it kind of opens up to the possibilities of different types of automation um, and the flexibility of the project to be able to um, uh, support different use cases. Uh, one, of, one of the two things I want to really call out is, uh, you know, the Git T support. Um, we merged that over the weekend. That's really a big deal. Um, it's really kind of pushes our mantra of, uh, of supporting open source, not only for the project itself, but for other projects. Um, and, you know, the ongoing work that's being done to support open tofu um, within the project as well. Um, some of the big pro uh, challenges with the project is one is just just governance. I spent the last six months, I think, you know, organizing meetings, you know, creating documentation. You know, when you work with an open source project, you don't really think about, you know, just the code. Um, there's a lot that goes into trying to steer a project, trying to organize, you know, um, and uh, coordinate people around, uh, hey, this is the goals, this is what the project's trying to achieve. Um, and so I'm happy to say, you know, we finally have a governance stack. Um, part of our application to CNCF is to kind of re, re, rebirth the project in a way that, you know, follows open source and CNCF, um, you know, standards so that it makes it easier not only for users to support and have faith in the project, but companies as well. Um, one of the big things I like to call it as well is, you know, uh, I have, uh, between me and Pepe, we've, we've changed the re release pro process for uh, Atlantis. Uh, previously, it was just, you know, we were, you know, spotting off releases, oh, here's patch release, it was all off of main, and it was very, very uh, difficult to bug fix because you'd write a, write a patch release off of main and it would include a feature that someone wrote two weeks ago and then that broke something else. and. So we've changed it so now that there's uh, minor re re release branches, it's uh, trunk-based deployment, um, where every time there's a release, a minor release, we cut off a branch and all patches come, uh, you know, stay on that branch. So there's no um, possibility of a new feature um, sneaking into a patch release. Um, another thing is that the, the, the project is very much contributor um, uh, heavy. Uh, the code base it has a lot of features. A lot of people have, uh, you know, over the years done PRs to support their use case, their features, and we're happy to do so. But that leaves a lot of technical debt within the code because someone that wrote some feature to do a specific thing two years ago is no longer around and no one has any idea what the heck that feature does or, you know, and if you change something else, well, now that feature is broken, well, no one knows how to fix it. And so it can be very difficult to try and, um, you know, maintain uh, that code. Um, and then the, the way the VCS providers are maintained, they are maintained within the, the code binary itself. Uh, it's very difficult to do integration testing because I can tell you right now, I only really use GitHub. If someone comes to me and says, hey, you know, I have a problem with my GitLab instance and running Atlantis, I'm kind of scratching my head a little bit because I'm like, and so it, uh, the majority of the bugs with Atlantis are uh, usually the VCS provider specific. You know, it's very, you know, and it's very difficult to try and support um, that as well in trying to um, hunt that down. So um, because a lot of our use, user base is, is GitHub favored. Um, so that's one of the 
challenges. Specifically with open tofu, we have been making progress to try and remove a lot of references to Terraform. This project was really, you know, originally created around Terraform, so there's a lot of hard-coded references to the binary in the code base. So there's a lot of a lot of work being done to try and find those and try and kind of remove those and um, abstract them out. Um, we're also working to add open tofu to our container build process so that it ships with uh, open tofu. Um, and that um, we add support to auto download the uh, open tofu binary like uh, Atlantis does for Terraform if you don't currently have it installed. Um, right now you can use open tofu with Atlantis, but you will need to use the custom workflow. Um, process. Um, the, essentially, you can override the commands that are run during plan and apply um, to use a different binary, and you would just specify Tofu instead of Terraform in this case. Um, this is the same workflow that people use for Terragrunt, um, so uh, we're working to get that uh, documentation added so it's clear for people who want to use Tofu while we work on official support. Um, and then, of course, I added the issue epic for Open Tofu if people want to follow along. Uh, project roadmap. Um, so obviously we're not 1.0. I think there's a uh, you know a lot of projects tend to follow the oh only minor releases. Well, I promise we will cut a major release. We're not going to go be up to 0.50. Um, but there's a, some of the things that need to be done before we get then is we need to clean up and remove some of the uh, configuration flags that are deprecated. Um, there's um, some remaining code. QL quality issues that we need to address. There is a long-standing regression with uh, file locking when it comes to um, running parallel plans and applies. Um, that's something we have been actively tracking with um, some proposals and to make sure that um, we uh, address it properly. Um, you know, the new release process, which is already done, and of course, open tofu support. Uh, but for future releases long term, we're planning to try and decouple the VCS providers into a plugin based architecture to try and kind of spin off essentially Atlantis core from um, the providers and moving more towards a uh, plugin based system that will allow people to essentially support or add support for different uh, different abstractions without having to uh, have to come to the Atlantis maintainers and get our approval. Um, like I said before, we're trying to be more cloud native than you know, multi-server HD right now. Atlantis is a single binary. It most likely will stay a single binary, but we'll probably the the current uh, discussion around that is that we'll probably have um, different flags for how the binary runs, whether it's a you know server role or a worker role. Um, some groundwork's already done there with uh, external data stores, with whether you are storing the state in Red, externally in Redis or the internal Bolt DB. Um, and then, of course, the important one, vendor neutrality. Um, currently, the Docker image ships with Terraform and ConfTest uh, already in there. Um, and one of the big things that I've been trying to push with the project is that we shouldn't really be biased towards what tool or provider or... I, I see, you know, infrastructure as cold tool that you want to use, you know, uh, what Atlantis does well is that it's an orchestrator around your version control and your pull requests, and you should be able to, it kind of highlights with our work with Open Tofu that, you know, a lot of the stuff is hard coded and that shouldn't be hard coded in the project. Um, and some of that comes up with some of the recent features with policy tooling. Um, uh, with ComTest and, you know, the different types of policy tools that are out there. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're not um, alienating or, you know, throwing inherent bias towards uh, a specific tool versus another. Um, so that's one of the one of the things we want to be conscious towards. And that's about it. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, we have a little bit time. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, that's a that's a before our time question. Uh, <laughs> Definitely before me. So yeah, <laughs> yeah I, don't, I actually don't know. No, I, I, we don't know the reason why. Uh, I think it was the coolest next name uh, that uh, Luke found in the internet at that time before AI. So it's a proper, you know, created name. So, but actually, don't we don't know? Actually, funny enough, that we we had a, a at some point we have left uh, uh, trying to uh, integrate with us, um, and they wanted to create a, a new version of Atlantis 1.0 with worker using Temporal, 
uh, and, uh, and they were going to call it uh, Nautilus. So to continue the, you know, the trend, but we do not know where, where that name comes from. Any other, any other questions? Yeah. So that's, that's probably the. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So the question was around um, there's the the scaling issue with Atlantis. You know, when you have people that um, are open, yeah, you are open up PRs and they are in quick succession of each other. There seems to be a, a locking issue uh, with Atlantis. And how do we? How have we addressed it? Or you know, do we have any suggestions for? Uh, improving that. That's one of the things I called out in the slide specifically, the file locking. Um, it's definitely something that we're well aware of. It's probably the most, the highest priority issue right now because um, you're not the only one that has reported it. You're not the only one that has seen it. Um, it has to do um, essentially, you know, there's unfortunately not really a great way around it right now. Um, the best way to address that is um, it has to do with how it actually is holding the lock. Right now, Atlantis locks on the repo name, the PR number, and then the workspace that it's currently in. And a lot of people, especially if they run TerraGrunt deployments, they don't use utilize Terraform workspaces. So everything runs within the default workspace. And what happens is because of that, if you have multiple people working in the same PR uh, or trying to, or if you have multiple projects within the same PR, um, those lock up and you don't get that parallel uh, plan and apply going because it is holding a lock for that first project uh, on the repo name and the PR number uh, because it's all being run in the same workspace. So that's being, you know, we have a proposal out for it right now. It, I, I don't remember the Git issue number, but I linked it in the slides. The slides will be posted on the, um, I'll make sure the slides get posted. Um, but it's a, we, you know, we're following a new proposal format when, you know, the architecture decision reviews ADR. So it's ADR number two, of course, the first one being that we're going to use ADRs for proposals. Um, the, uh, but it is, it, there is a deep dive with that issue. There's a pull request out for it where we're trying to address different proposals of how to fix that actual locking. And it probably will have to do with adding more cardinality around what exactly are we locking on. Um, one of the issues that just recently came up has to do with project names. Um, the state that Atlantis holds on to doesn't really track project names right now. Um, and we've been working to fix that. Um, and uh, previously, we, there has been attempts to address the locking by using the path of the project, but that encountered issues. And I think even Pepe had to revert some things with that. Mm -hmm. um, and so going forward, we'll probably have to, once the project name it has f support within the, the, the backend database, um, we will probably use that to, as an additional cardinality for file locking to know this project is currently has a lockout and it doesn't impact the other projects so you get proper parallelization when you're doing those plan implies in a single PR. Now, now to add to that, there, there is, the, you know, companies that are run, you know, I mentioned companies that they run 500 PRs or so a day or uh, they, they, add, they actually, those, those companies do not use auto plan. So that's one big thing that people love about Atlantis, but actually when you get to that scale, you, you don't want Atlantis just to create a log file on the plan. Uh, the, I think that there is a PR, or we merged it, I can't recall, where, um, because right now Atlantis supports disable the locking. So you can disable the lock on Atlantis, but now then you try some the Terraform lock, no? Against your remote state. So it all depends. So at, at the end of the day, you end up being, right now, for, for, for how Atlantis works right now, is a matter of communications. If you, if um, I, I actually never had this problem much before, even in medium-sized teams, because we disable a, a, a auto, uh, um, auto plan, and then you know I will create 
I will run my Atlantis command, you know, Atlantis plan, and maybe I have a project name, project Pepe, and then, oh, I got a log, oh, why, 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 why I'm seeing the log? And then I would talk to that person, hey, are you working on this? I didn't know, and then we would try to see who, who goes first, depending on what the issue is and what they want to fix. So there's a lot of coordination, which is a matter of communication, but um, there is ways around it uh, right now, uh, but it's a bit more, you have to do it more you know, manual, human, you know, not automated, yeah. Are we? Yeah, just so I have a couple of questions about one information. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, that there's a lot of technical debt. How, how are you going about uh, deprecating things that nobody uses? Mm. So the question was, um, what are we doing to address some of the technical debt or maybe possibly deprecating features? Um, it's something that we, it's a great question, uh, we haven't done yet. We definitely should and plan to. Um, it, it is, uh, it's, it's hard to kind of, you know, juggle that with, you know, because the part of a project is understanding your users and your code base and who's using what. Uh, so you don't want to es essentially go through and deprecate something and then have to, you know, kind of walk it back because, you know, people, you know, people weren't interacting with the community and then you deprecate a feature and then they come out of the woodwork and say, hey, no, I was using that. What are you doing? <laughs> um, so um, it's, you know, it, that's part of, you know, kind of what uh, how I'm learning to be a maintainer with an open source project. That's one of the things you don't really think about, um, you know, next to governance and, you know, uh, you know, technically technical steering. Um, but that is a great question. And that's something that we definitely uh, probably should address going forward. I mean, um, to add to that a little bit, it, we, we do actually spend a lot of time looking on regressions, or if there is any regressions or or new features, because we have seen regressions before of people, you know, creating a PR like uh, like Dylan was saying, that it would work for, for their uh, pro so, uh, to solve their problem, but then it could break something else. So we, we we actually spend a lot of time, and that's why now, if you notice, the releases are less uh, 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 often. often because because we want to take the time to actually look into, we have more core uh, maintainers. If you want to be a maintainer of our source project, talk to us, um, because we need more help. I mean, without, without I mean, we, we have regular jobs and, and we do, I, I do this in the weekend for the last three years. Um, so it, it actually is, you know, it's hard to, with all the work that you do, plus actually, you know, look for every PR, which I actually do in my, that, that's my mornings, look at Atlantis PR. It's still, things can go, through and then you realize, oh, okay, we broke this thing in GitLab right now. So um, over, I think in the future, we you are going to see more ADRs coming in to like, for example, talk about what is a status? What is a VCS status? How we define a status? What is actually a, 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 a properly applied status or a properly planned status and how that would change in the VCS and so on. And that decoupling that Dylan was talking uh, will help us to actually have less of that code um, so yeah, so that's uh, part of the answer, I guess. Yeah. Any? Uh, if I can ask a follow-on question. Yeah. Uh, what's your philosophy around uh, parity between the VCSs? Between the and the so the question was, what was our philosophy on parity between the VCSs? Um, you know, I. I can't speak for Pepe, but I think we're pretty aligned. Like when it comes to philosophy, we try to support all of them as best as possible, um, and um, it can be it can be difficult to do so if you don't use a specific VCS every day. But just like we just merged the Git T support, you know, we are not you know if there is you know contributions or people that want to support a specific VCS provider, we are not you know we come one come all. Um, we definitely are, you know, trying to support as many as we can. It, it, it would be nice that, you know, if GitLab and GitHub, is, is anyone here from the company uh, <laughs> to, to talk to us? Uh, it, it would be really cool that it would be the other way around, you, you know, for like open source uh, projects where, you know, the VCSs basically contribute to us for to maintain, you know, what is a good status on their system. It would be amazing if that could be a thing because is actually the biggest pain point we have for integrations, uh, you know, especially for the, the VCSs that are using really big companies uh, like mine. 
Uh, he uses Bitbucket, who knows Bitbuckets? Uh, so there's not many Bitbucket users, and then the problem with that is that, well, then there is less features for Bitbucket too in Atlantis, so then it lags behind a really long time. And you know, one of the problems we have, our documentation is not paired with the version that on Atlantis. So yeah, some people go into the documentation, oh, I'm going to use this, you know, GitHub, uh, this team thing, and maybe it works in, in Bitbucket. No, it doesn't. Oh, it, maybe it works in GitLab. No, it doesn't. So because we, we cannot keep up with all the changes from the BCS, and, and same with the API changes. You know, we have many regressions on API changes that we had to address in GitLab. And usually because there is so many people, we get a lot of PRs right away, very, very quick. But pe people see the problems before we can actually fix them. So yeah. One more question? Go ahead. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, the question was, uh, how do you deploy Atlantis in Kubernetes without, without first deploying Atlantis? Uh, which is a classic chicken and egg problem. Um, and the answer to that is a lot of people tend to deploy it with you know, AWS Fargate, or they tend to deploy it by itself standalone um, if you're using Atlantis to maintain your Kubernetes clusters. Um, and um, or in some cases, uh, it depends on you know. It depends on your environment. I know people that are comfortable deploying Atlantis in Kubernetes because they only use it. They they deploy their you know their their management cluster first. They deploy Atlantis in there manually, and then from there they manage the rest of the clusters that they manage with Terraform. So it's it's really up to you on how you uh, your process for standing up your uh, infrastructure and what comes first. Um, and having Atlantis part of your you know ma you know your management plane. Um, but I know people deploy it, you know, standalone on EC2 or Fargate or, you know, what, whatever cloud provider they use um, uh, to deploy. Yeah, and, and it's a similar question as to how, how you deploy your state for Terraform before and how do you import it. It's, it's, the, same, it's the same problem. And it will depend on your workflow, how, how you like to create the first PR zero. You know that we I, I like to call it that 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 starting blueprint for inf your infrastructure. So some people actually run create the, uh, the Atlantis deployment um, first as a standalone, um, maybe in the quickest way they can to create to actually start the workflow through PRs. So there is a history of the PR, and then they move to they move that that webhook to the deployment on, on Kubernetes after the Kubernetes cluster is r up and running. So that's. Another way you can, because you can actually deploy Atlantis with Atlantis. So if you want to do it through Terraform and, and create a PR against it. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.